I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about whether EEG-based neurofeedback can really help with mental health conditions. Neurofeedback is one of the most popular alternatives to medications for treating ADHD. It's been around for more than 50 years, and several large meta-analyses and several well-designed, rigorously done studies have been very disappointing in terms of not showing much of a benefit or not showing that the benefits outweighed being in any treatment for ADHD. Now, this doesn't disprove that it works. It just means that particularly relative to how much it's being pushed in the real world and how much money is being made in those endeavors, there's very little good documentation that can work. However, there's a new study out of China and this used EEG neurofeedback in an individualized way in a whole brain approach. This was actually treating methamphetamine induced, so it's not directly ADHD, but they did show an impressive reduction in methamphetamine craving, and all previous work indicates that craving is tightly tied to substance abuse. Hans Berger, a psychiatrist in 1924, Germany, did the first recording of a live human brain, first recording of electrical activity. And he named this the electroencephalogram, or EEG. And he's the one who started the practice of naming electrical activity based on their wavelengths, giving them Greek names. So, for example, alpha represents more of a relaxed but alert state. I do have more detailed discussion of EEG and brain waves in a video on gamma oscillations, and neurofeedback means that you are presenting some measure of the brain's activity in real time to an individual, usually displayed in some graphic format. These days, it's on a computer screen. It might be a rocket ship that condenses the information in it. It might be graphs or pictures. It might be some other animated cartoon. And then the subject is encouraged to try to change what they're seeing on the screen, in order to do that, they need to be changing their brain waves or brain activity. Hopefully that change that they're able to reproducibly learn to create then results in some improvement in mental health functioning or decrease in symptomatology. EEG and functional MRI are being used in neurofeedback studies. You could use other measures. EEG is attractive in terms of good temporal resolution, almost exactly in real time. You can see what your brain is doing. However, EEG has poor spatial resolution. It doesn't tell you what specific area in the brain. It's more general activity in large parts of the brain that can be extracted. In contrast, functional MRI has much better spatial resolution, but it's a little slower. So if you're studying brain activity that happens very quickly or is very brief, then it's harder to do. It wasn't until the 1960s that there was actually widespread acceptance that any kind of neurofeedback based on EEG could even work. So again, there were some studies going back to mid-30s that people were sort of incredulous that anyone could actually learn to change their own brain electrical activity. Three general types of protocols were developed. One was changing, getting people to alter the relative ratio of theta waves to beta waves, that's called TBR, theta-beta ratio. Another general protocol involved looking at the sensory motor strip and trying to decrease activity in that region. And then there's a third protocol called slow cortical potential. So part of it is that the field hadn't settled on any one best way to try to train brains. And secondly, that each individual clinician or clinic or clinician in a clinic often had their own ideas about what would be most effective or most useful. Even though there's standardized placements of the EEG electrodes, that is assuming that everyone's skull correlates very clearly with the underlying brain structures beneath it. There is a very well done, rigorously conducted large study at the very end of 2022 that came out. That study failed to find any clear benefit for ADHD, and it actually was accompanied by an editorial suggesting that we should just stop doing these studies and stop offering this as a treatment since dozens of studies had failed to show much of an impact. Now, that was maybe a little overly negative, although two large meta-analyses have been published on neurofeedback for ADHD since then. 
both of them, the main conclusion is that there were no clear-cut benefits. One of the studies hedged a little bit and found that there were a few studies that seemed to be working, but a range of studies, there was so much inconsistency. study that I'm going to describe in a little more detail, it was conducted by Gao and colleagues at the University of Science and Technology in China, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2025. And they were actually looking at methamphetamine abuse, which is a hard condition to treat. They were examining only men and men who were in a residential treatment program. And in their first study, 33 subjects and 33 controls, what they did is they showed the individual methamphetamine, and that induces craving within addicts. They recorded the whole brain pattern of activity of arousal that was going on, not just in one region, not just in one frequency, not just alpha waves or beta waves, but everything. They had a computerized method of translating that into a graphic. And then they trained the subject. Subjects had 10 sessions, training sessions, where they learned to suppress their overall brain activity. So those were the active treatment subjects. Control subjects, again, 33 men, had the same general protocol, but rather than being exposed to their own brain activity when they were craving, were exposed to a randomly chosen member of the first half of the group. So they were trying to change a pattern of brain activity that wasn't their own induced by the craving. And in that group, they were not successful in learning to suppress that overall brain activity. And when they tested them, they did not show any marked decrease in craving or response inhibition when exposed to cues of craving. Again, they were able to decrease their brain activity pattern and they were able to suppress their craving, and they compared in the second study just to subjects who were in the inpatient rehabilitation center for methamphetamine, and the EEG feedback group showed much greater ability to decrease their activation in response to being exposed to methamphetamine cues. Now, it should be pointed out the results don't show real-world activity, so it doesn't say, did they actually go on to abuse less or have fewer addictive behaviors, fewer days, lower dosages in the real world after they left the treatment program. But again, all previous work shows that a very strong predictor of going and continuing a methamphetamine addiction is showing a craving response and not being able to resist that when exposed to cues. So that supporting that this is not just a fluke, again, they did two separate studies within the one publication. But the same group had used the same technique for nicotine addiction. And given that nicotine addiction may be using some of the same patterns of circuitry, but also almost certainly is using some different brain circuitry, that's reassuring that they're really onto something. And they also cited previous work, particularly looking at EEG neurofeedback for treating depression. And in those depression studies, the best predictor of improvement was actually a whole brain pattern of brain activity rather than the specific area that the group was trying to train or change with their EEG neurofeedback. Individualizing treatment for each specific patient, you know, maybe we are really getting into an era of specialized treatment, of individualized treatment, of not treating everyone the same, and that the whole brain pattern was more critically important than what we designated or thought were the important networks or circuitry for that problem. And that makes, to me, some amount of sense in that probably everyone who's an addict does have some common dimension to their addiction, some common reward circuitry aberrancies, but each person is getting there by a different means of different intellectual strengths, different other weaknesses or cravings or patterns or ways to resist it. And it's that whole brain activation pattern that seems to be more important than any individual pathway. They posited in the report that it might have been this individualized whole brain technique was actually enhancing executive functions such as attention, such as response inhibition, such as impulsivity, and why it was effective. That's a hypothesis that needs to be tested, but if so, then that 
clearly has direct implications for neurofeedback EEG for ADHD. Interesting thing is that some of this research is actually going against a modern phenomena. So in the last two or three years, there are more than a dozen devices on the market of do-it-yourself-at-home neurofeedback using EEG principles. And why say it goes against it? Most of these home-use devices are using a very standardized feedback system. So they're either looking at one specific area of the brain or they're looking at usually beta and theta waves and trying to change the ratio of those. So they tried to standardize it you know, so they can sell it to everyone, but that might be exactly the direction that's going to be at least productive or helpful overall. That's all. Stay healthy, stay happy.